Hey, welcome to another episode. I am Brian Grayson, your host, and today I'm super excited to welcome Matthew Miro, co-founder and CMO of Thermodry, the at-home anti-sweat device for hands, feet, and underarms. Hey, Matthew, thanks for being on the show. Great pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, and what a coincidence. We were talking offline before hitting record that, you know, I'm from Argentina and your mother is too, right? Yes, Argentinians are great people. It's a <laughs> great place to be. Yeah, and from Cordoba, which is for those who are not familiar with Cordoba, it's like a state or a province in Argentina. It's pretty cool, pretty unique with some you know, unique like uh, drinks or beverages, unique, you know, um, music styles like it's super fun, super fun. Yeah, yeah. No, I went there a couple of times and every time, the thing that amazes me the most is how people are nice in Argentina. It's everybody's so friendly. Everybody wants to help yeah. you. And the, the the concept of bubble where, you know, you hear North America, like, oh, don't get too close to me. You're in my bubble in Argentina. That does not exist. Everybody's in each other's bubble. Everybody's hugging. Everybody's touching. Argentina yeah. is a great place to, to be and to learn from those people because uh, they're truly yeah, we, wonderful people. Yeah, we thank you. We kiss a lot here. We kiss like in the gym, yeah. of course. Not weird things, but yeah. <laughs> so, but we we have wikis. Like we are very open. And uh, I have a client from the states that he after before the pandemic he came down here to to live, and I was saying like you're crazy. Like we want to go live in the states, and you want to come live in Argentina. He said, dude, you know, I'm super happy here. And I, even the, the cable guy, the, the, the technical person from the cable company, he came to install this and uh, invited me to play a soccer game, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with friends. And like, he was like, everyone is so kind, so open. He's like, I'm full of friends, full of, so yeah, it's something people say from us. And I appreciate that. It's a special place for sure. I would recommend everybody to go. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so why don't you tell the audience more about you and Derma Dry? Great. So my story is a very similar story to a lot of people. I'm sure I am here in Montreal, Canada, which is the francophone part of Canada. I went to high school, CJEP University. I did a master's in marketing. And I was in a bar with one of my friends and my friend was saying, hey, Matt, um, I, I think I'm going to launch a business. I have cured my sweaty hands. And then I'm like, what? You have sweaty hands? The first time he ever told me about this. I'm like, what? You want to start a business about sweaty hands? This is so weird. So I don't know if it was the alcohol or the music, but I said, you know what? I'm in. Let's do it. And we started a business really to treat excessive sweating uh, based on a technology called ion tophoresis. Um, what is ion tophoresis? Where does it come from? So basically, just to give you a bit of a backstory, my friend who had sweaty hands, he tried everything to treat his sweaty hands. He put deodorants on his hands. Um, he wanted to try oral medication, but the problem with that is that it's not only your hands that become dry, but it would be your whole body. Um, and he finally found a solution that's called ion tophoresis. It is kind of odd to describe. Basically, you put your skin in contact with water and electricity. And basically, the electricity is going to kind of disrupt the connection between the nerve and the sweat gland. So you won't be sweating anymore, which kind of seems weird to a lot of people, I'm sure, to have you know, found a business on this. But for people who have sweaty hands, such as my, my co-partner, it's really the only thing you think about. So he would start his business meetings with friends or with the um, colleagues. And the first thing you do is, you know, you, you have to grab somebody's hand. You need to shake people's hand. So the first moment before, so the first thing, you know, the first impression that you give, he was so afraid. He was so stressed out. So you could, you could understand how that would really foreshadow the whole meeting so he was uncomfortable giving the hand and then the whole meeting would think like ah oh, did he realize that my hands were sweaty is he still thinking about my clammy hands and it really 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 had a huge impact on his work life as I mentioned on his love life of course because every time you would meet a girl and he would need to hold their hand or give them a hug he could also think about is she going to realize that I'm sweaty and anxious etc and finally 
Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I, I want to interrupt you for a second before I, I lose it and my apologies, but it's what you just said, it's genius and I want to break it down in one minute. So for everyone listening to this or watching, you know, this right here is marketing in its purest form. I don't explain why or why I think it is. He's not just saying, you know, my friend has started this because he has sweaty hands. Sweaty hands are, you know, the external thing he's experiencing. How is it making him feel? The situations he's putting him on or the how uncomfortable he is, how insecure it makes the person, you know, holding the, ha the hand of this girl or a guy or, you know, being in a meeting, the handshake, the first impression to give someone. That's the exact reason why people take action on anything. So if you are doing an ad, a video, or organic content, and say, in this case, hey, you have sweaty hands, nobody's going to pay attention. But if you talk about how people feel, this is really important right here. So what you just said, without noticing or with, the, you know, uh, consciously, it's a masterclass on, you know, how to market something and the the importance of, of the why behind the apparent reason that is actually not. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically, um, it's the first time ever been, anybody said I did a this. I when I spoke it was a masterclass. So, thank you so much about that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, but um, so basically, it really affected his whole life. Uh, it was really problematic for him. Um, and we that because so basically, why he started the business is was because he had such a big problem, and we realized that it was clearly a market because it had such a big impact on his life if for him it didn't really bother him or well, we wouldn't have started this because uh, we had known okay it's, it's not that important so because for him it had such a big impact we knew we were going to be able to change a lot of people's lives and for us the bigger the impact the bigger the business potential was there so we said to ourselves you know what let's do this it's going to take six months we're going to be on the market and we were, we were, you know, maybe 25, 26. We were so naive. We thought in six months we were going to be in the market. It actually took almost, I, I think it almost took like three years for us to be on the market. So we started in 2016 and the machine officially was cleared by Health Canada in, in 2019. So um, this is also something I like to say that if, you, if we knew how hard it would be, we would never have done it. But, you know, so it's like you need to be very naive and optimistic to go in business because it's always going to be so much harder than you think. So if you don't have that kind of the grit, the resilience, it's not even worth it. You need to expect the worst. And that's not even as hard as it's going to be. So <laughs> a bit of, you know, uh, um, foreshadowing. It, it's never easy. But once you get to the top of the mountain, once you accomplish what you did, you're going to be so much more happier the harder it is. Exactly. It's worth it. I mean, if you're doing something yeah. you're passionate about and the mission is worth it for you, if you're helping someone with something, in, uh, yeah, it, it makes it makes it uh, it makes, you know, the, the, the effort worthwhile. And yeah, it's satisfying. But yeah, entrepreneurs, all of us are crazy, you know, uh, and yeah, it's it's the way always people say, you know. If we knew what we were getting into, we would have never done it. So yeah, 100%. So in this case, you, I don't know if you define your company as a medical company, but in that case, yeah. So you, you, you have a medical company in the DDC space. That's not something I hear every day. So what does it feel like? Is it an advantage? Is it not? Yeah, it's a great advantage. And um, basically, we all come, all the co-founders, we come from an e-commerce background. Um, and for us, it just was the most natural thing in the world to open up a Shopify store, per products on Shopify, start selling directly to our consumers. Every time we talk to our partner, outside partner or a bank, for them, it's like, no, you, you're selling medical products. You need to be a BT, a B, a business to business, BT, a B to B. But for us, like, why would you want to have a middleman that takes your margin? Why don't you want to have a direct um, link to your client so you could gather more information, learn more about them, and have a quicker 
um, cycle of innovation because you're in direct contact with the consumer. So for us, since day one, it was very, very clear. And actually, we did not even think there was an, any other way to be direct to a consumer. So the, the, the really interesting thing is that I feel like in the re more recent years, there's like this kind of concept of like having a boring business. People are like, no, don't go into a tech, don't go into a, you know, Silicon Valley businesses that make real money without risks or boring companies such as uh, cleaning um, homes or like uh, trash companies and stuff like that. Because people who are in that market are usually older generation. They don't know how to do marketing. Um, so if you are young, savvy, and know how to do online marketing, you're just going to you know, demolish them. And in our case, that was exactly what happened. All our competitors did not even know what was a Google ad. All our competitors had no idea what was Facebook. So when we came to the market, um, uh, pay for clicks for Google for any types of searches to enter for these machines, uh, excessive sweating, hyperhidrosis. It was so cheap, dirt, dirt, dirt cheap. Uh, same thing for Facebook. We were able to do ads at such a low cost. So this is also a great example of like boring businesses where you don't have much competitors. Uh, it's really an amazing thing to do because you you really have such an advantage if you know how to use Google, if you know how to use Facebook. And th this is a really stupid example, but you know, they, I have I followed these people online who say like, go do a boring business, such as you know, um, cleaning driveways. Because if you call people who clean driveways, nine nine times out of ten, they'll never answer a callback. So if you're just a business who does things correctly, you will be most of business in these types of areas. So one day I was looking for something very specific for a machine. Um, and I called like 10 companies who do uh, medical devices and nobody answered the phone. Nobody called me back. It was such a terrible experience. So if you just do an approach of DDC with boring businesses, you will demolish the market for sure. What about the, you mentioned that there weren't many or almost any competitors doing what you were doing in the DTC space. No. So do you think it would be easy for a competitor to, I mean, is it because of lack of companies or is it because there aren't many companies doing what you do because it's hard to start a business like yours? So uh, there was about six competitors. There's still about six competitors in our space. They took the business model of selling via insurance. So more of a B2B kind of so business to business uh, approach. And that really left us a huge opening. So we were really able to aggressively come into the market, go not seal the competitors, but really be the most uh, approachable company. And we became that way the number one IATROF resist uh, provider in all the world. But if somebody's listening to this market, to this podcast and says, hey, this seems like a great idea. <laughs> IATROF resist doesn't seem that complicated. I'm going to steal their market. It's actually really, really hard. Um, there's this concept called the moat. Uh, it's really promoted often by this uh, almost, you know, guru in the DTC space. Uh, his name is Peter Thiel. He was one of the co-founders of uh, PayPal and he's done a lot of different things since. But one of the things he did that influenced a lot of people, he wrote a book called Zero to One, where he says that the, the goal of every company is basically to be a monopoly. And when you are a monopoly, basically, well, you have much more advantages, your margins are better, et cetera. So in the book, he tells about the importance of a moat. And basically the moat is uh, when you have a castle, the surrounding of the castle, the water, so that way your competitors or um, adversaries can come into the, the castle. So in our case, our moat is called regulations, which is at the beginning, we hated them. It was so complicated becoming certified. It was so hard, so time consuming, it took so much money and investments. But now that we have these certificates, we are so happy because no, almost nobody could get in our space. We have this kind of a golden field um, where we can not basically do what we want, but we can expand really at our, at our rate to do, uh, because exactly, if somebody who wants to start selling an ITRO for this machine, it's going to take years and years, but I don't want to say don't do it. What I'm saying is that really find a, a field that you're uh, passionate in and try to make sure that you're able to build a moat around it. And one of these modes can definitely be regulations. So everything that is 
health certifications, uh, everything that is a product uh, certification, such as the GMP, so good manufacturing practice. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that is one of the best ways to build a long and durable business is to have a good moment around you. And talking about growing a business, you know, yeah. you, I know that, you know, many years ago, you achieved your first million in sales and you have yeah. grown a lot ever since, right? So I wanted to ask, you know, which things do you remember being obsessed about uh, when you were, uh, you know, uh, trying to get to the first million and which metrics or which things were areas of the business are you obsessed with these days? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the, the principal obsession of the business since the beginning was very consumer centric. Uh, we were big fans of uh, Amazon and how their cons customer service was really amazing. Um, and for us as being people who almost exclusively buy online, uh, I don't know about you, but I basically buy only on Amazon just because it gets to my home. I don't need, need to move. If I don't like it, I re could return it very, very, very easily. And I'm able to see reviews and talking to Amazon. It's always like you feel that the customer is king. If something's not right with my order, they always give me a refund. So we really wanted to be consumer centric also because my colleague had this condition, hyperhidrosis. And we knew firsthand how impactful it could be on people. Um, people who have hyperhidrosis are almost 20 times more prone to have severe anxiety, severe depressions, um, suicidal thoughts. And this is all things that we hear with our clients. So at the beginning, we didn't have much anyways, liquidities to grow the business fast. Um, we were always self-funded almost. So for us, the priority was, okay, we're going to build this slowly, but every time we do a sale, we need to make sure that the person who bought the machine is happy with the machine um, and that it really has, we, the promise that we do that we change in people's lives, we want to make sure that we fulfill it. So uh, yeah, the first metric was customer service for sure. And the second was, was simply pro, uh, to be um, profitable, to be profitable because we were self-funded. And if we were not able to be uh, profitable, we would, you know, I would need to basically live in the streets. So we, we didn't have any choice then to be profitable and uh, to make sure that uh, our bottom line was very well respected. Well, is one of the main challenges these days, especially for yeah. low demand, but across the board, I would say that it's one of the, you know, more, let's say, common conversations that I'm having, you know, more frequent conversations that I'm having, you know, last year, this year, you know, yeah. many were created post-COVID and even those that were created pre-COVID were struggling mm -hmm. a lot in the last few years. So it's, you know, supply chain issues, recession, inflation, uh, costs going up. So you name it, a, a million things. Yeah. So in this case, how are you navigating those waters how are you, how are you, you know, achieving this profitability that you wanted? Yeah, well, so I guess like a lot of businesses, and if you listen to a lot of business podcasts, and I'm sure you spoke to a lot of PS people who it was similar. So basically, when COVID hit, initially it was really bad for a business. Uh, it was kind of dreadful working so hard. So that's kind of funny. We, we basically became FDA cleared, so we were able to sell in the U.S. market early May and we were like this is gonna change our lives <laughs> we finally made it and basically 20 days later the whole economy collapsed everything closed and we were not able to do anything so we went from the king of the world you know to <laughs> the on the bottom of the streets very very quickly but initially we were terrified and afterwards pretty quickly we realized that COVID was really really good for us um, people were at home and basically the only thing they could concentrate was like the little things, the little things was like, oh, I always wanted to treat my sweaty hands. Maybe now is the time because I have so much time on my hands. And so that was a big, big boost on business. At that point, we grew exponentially. We hired a lot. We uh, got bigger offices and basically I think it's, a, it's for sure it's a lesson that a lot of businesses need to go through we started carrying on a lot of weight. And when interest rates went up, 
um, when people had much less uh, side revenues because they didn't have any more money coming in because of the uh, government uh, uh, COVID funds. So less disposable income. So basically we needed to um, make sure that we need to be profitable. And of course we need to do some hard decisions. And since that point, we promised to ourselves every time we hire someone, we need to make sure that he brings, you know, at least twice the salary. Every time that we buy stock, we need to make sure that we buy, you know, only the strict necessary. So three months in advance, six months in advance. Whereas before when my money was piling in, we, it was, you know, you, you don't even look anymore at, at how much money you're spending. So it was kind of a humility lesson. And now we are much closer to our money. We're much closer to our spending columns and our Excel sheets. Um, and it's a good lesson to learn now because we're still very early in the business before we become too big because it leaves marks, you know, it leaves almost physical marks on yourself. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe how close. We, we never went close to bankruptcy, of course, but it just, it's not a good feeling to know that you need to lay certain people off. It's not a good feeling to know that uh, all the money you spent on stock, well, now it's going to be sleeping downstairs and you're not selling as fast as you want. So one of the ways to reduce stress, of course, is just learning to spend your money much better. And advertising, oh my God, Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a huge thing. I was going to ask you about that, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, so you, you, you were, I don't know if you were built on Facebook, but you leveraged Facebook ads a lot, especially in the beginning, right? So, yeah. and it was really cheap, Google ads, Facebook ads, as you said, in the beginning it was really cheap, but what does it look like now? Are you moving out of it? Are you... Is it still your main revenue driver, big, biggest spender, et cetera? Yeah, so we, at the base start of the business, we would like to say that we were almost a Facebook agency more than anything else, just because we would spend so much money on Facebook. But during COVID, Facebook was like a money maker. It was, you would put $1 into Facebook and Facebook would give you back in sales, 20, 30, $40. It was so, so easy to, spend money on Facebook and make money simply because everybody was in front of their computer. A lot of businesses decided to cut spending. So companies that would continue to spend, the CPM was much lower. So it was really easy to do Facebook marketing, uh, Google marketing, et cetera. But then of course, um, with the iOS update where you can do remarketing anymore, that really disrupted our business completely from almost you know, in one month, we needed to rethink how the business worked and Facebook from being the place where we spent the most money now, it's basically almost nothing. Um, and these are one of the things, of course, that forced us to be much more close to our money, understand our spending, et cetera. So instead of having a lot of paid uh, ad, now we try to do a lot of organic. So uh, via influencers, uh, via TikTok, via YouTube shorts, and we realized that initially we, we thought that our business was going to be really hard um, because we couldn't spend on Facebook anymore. But very quickly we realized that these alternatives such as TikTok uh, worked very, very well. Influencers worked very, very well. So no, we're really happy about where we are. I feel like uh, the business has never been in a better health. So uh, we're thrilled with the, the direction of the business right now. Two comments I have about that. The first one, for those listening or watching, they have like 15,000 followers, sorry, subscribers on YouTube. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while since the last long form video they recorded. It's like four or five years. And then all they do these days is shorts. Is that correct? Please yeah, tell absolutely. me why it happened and why did you decide to stop the long form and keep the short form? and how does it help your business? Because long, uh, long form videos are so much hard, to, so much work to do. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> the real reason is simply because we started doing videos on TikTok when it started being popular during COVID. And we realized that TikTok is a, maybe the most impressive tool of all times to have organic reach. It is simply phenomenal how one video can become viral and then your whole account blows up. 
And we were like, we have all this amazing content on TikTok. We need to repurpose it on other platforms. And Google started doing uh, YouTube shorts. We started uh, posting them on our YouTube shorts. And I strongly believe that maybe this is going to sound conspiracy conspirational, but I think that Google wanted to also wants to really compete uh, towards uh, TikTok. So they're promoting their take uh, their YouTube shorts. They're making sure that with you uh, you do good content, the content is going to be seen. So. Once we started putting their, the, the YouTube shorts, our account really exploded as well. Whereas our long uh, form videos, which of course takes a lot of time, didn't have that same type of impact. So we just learned to maximize our time with the, what, how can we, with the least amount of effort, have the biggest impact and for sure it's TikTok and YouTube shorts. TikTok, are you talking about organic or ads to, or TikTok shop as well? Um, so it's it's kind of sad because we're a Canadian business. Canada currently does not have TikTok shop. It's only in the United States and North America. But uh, also as a medical device, we would not be able to sell on TikTok shop. But uh, organic, organic. We, we do some ads, of course, but uh, we have found that the ads has much less impact because people very quickly see that it's an ad, so they're going to scroll up. Whereas when it's organic and organically uh, promoted by TikTok, of course, it, it can have such tremendous impact. Sometimes you post a video, you don't understand why you say like, okay, this is just like, this is not even a good video. And finally, it's the video that has, goes viral overnight. You wake up and you have all these comments you need to respond, all these people that want to buy your, your product. So we never, from, we started this business, well, we started selling in 2019, there was no, never channel that allowed us to have so much sales and so quickly by just one uh, viral video. It's amazing that it's growing social commerce, whether it's organic, whether it's TikTok shop, whether it's ads, it's, I don't know if the future, but the other day I mentioned this on LinkedIn, I was listening to this very new and amazing podcast that I love. It's called Awesome, A-S-O-M, uh, you know? It's um, like many cool people on there. It's like um, John Roman. He's the CEO of um, Battlebox, an amazing brand in the US. Jimmy Kim, you know, the the founder and CIO of uh, Sand Lane is like Clavio's main competitor. Then we have Ryan McDonald. Uh, Brian McDonald, sorry, he's like, um, I think CMO of a brand. And then we have an agency owner, uh, that designs like Shopify stores for Billie Eilish and like Rihanna and many, you know, amazing um, celebrities and, and, and brands as well. So they all put their perspectives together. And recently in the latest episode, uh, at least at the date of this recording, they were saying something like, you know, people want to buy when they are at, and that's something we know, but we can reimagine that like, I'm watching a Netflix TV show, a Netflix series, let's say, and it's like, oh, I love the t-shirt that this actor is wearing, buy, right? <laughs> I don't know if the website, the, like it, it, it almost like, think even thinking about it feels like slow, you know, like wasting time, like going to the, it's like, I want that, you know, I'm browsing YouTube now. Harley Fink Finkelstein, the the you know another Canadian, you know the the founder of Shopify, or not the founder, but the CEO of Shopify. You know he he announced the other day the partnership with um, Tink, with uh, sorry YouTube, and now you can buy directly, um, you know using Shopify checkout while watching a YouTube video, right? So it's the experience right in the moment. It's not on the e-commerce. So what you are doing now feels like a different channel, but you will be probably the future that will come next. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask, you know, talking about the message, the ads, because again, yeah. if we talk about a, a fashion, an, an apparel and fashion brand, skincare brand, uh, we, we kind of imagine some of the TikToks or ads we see in this case what do you do 
because I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your audience, you know, they, they have a condition and I think they might not be as comfortable as somebody who doesn't have a condition to talk about it. I don't know if it's a taboo thing or not, but how do you overcome that and how do you talk to them in a way that they engage with your ads and of course then, you know, buy? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question because hyperhidrosis, so excessive sweating, is uh, often mentioned in the scientific literature, so the health literature, as the taboo condition. Because people who have sweaty hands, feet, or underarms, they don't talk about it to anyone. So we decided very early on that one of the main purposes of the business was going to be to break the taboo on hyperhidrosis. So the way that we talk about it is usually either with humor, because of course humor is one of the ways to break a taboo, but also with a lot of sensitivity because we know how difficult it can be to have this condition. So one of the th main things we do is get influencers to talk about their condition. And once somebody opens the conversation, then you see in the comments, for example, people talking about their situation, oh, I had the same problem. Oh, this is how it impacted, impacted me. And that is a really powerful thing just to open the conversation. One of the other ways that we do to open the conversation is to do a scholarship around excessive sweating. So we, for example, we invite right now uh, students who have excessive sweating to tell us about their experience with uh, hyperhidrosis. And we post it on our YouTube channel. Last year, we had tremendous, tremendous uh, people tell us about their stories. We had this person who was an airplane a pilot who wanted to go to the army. And maybe, well, I didn't know this at the time, so maybe you don't know about this, but being an airplane pilot is actually in the army. It's actually one of the hardest things you could do. And he passed all the tests. It was like his life uh, goal. And, and just when he was like ready to become an Air, air Force pilot, because of his sweaty hands, he was denied. And he did his whole life sacrifices just because of this. So it was it was really beautiful thing just to learn more about these uh, students. So what we wanna do really is open up the conversation, but regarding ads specifically, uh, we just, you know, it's the classic ad structure where we talk about the problem, show the solution and uh, have the call to, to action. Um, and when it's more in the organic context where we, with humor, with sensitivity, and with the uh, authentic content that we try to open up and break the taboo of hyperhidrosis. What's next for Dermadry? Anything exciting you can share with the audience? Oh my God, what is next for Dermadry? Well, there's numerous things uh, we are trying every day to um, become more known because as you know, hyperhidrosis, I'm sure you don't know that word. <laughs> A lot of people just don't know that high, that you can sweat too much and it could be a condition. The first step, of course, is learning that you have a, a condition. And the second one is to sh tell people that iontophoresis, which is also a big word, uh, is probably the best solution for you. So the next step is always awareness. Try to people to get to learn more about our solution. And in the pipeline, we have two very exciting projects that sadly I can't talk about, but hopefully 2025, 2026, we'll be hearing much more of, uh, of Dermadry. Amazing. And we can do this again and we can talk about yeah, that. Exactly. Next. Exactly. Be... Yeah. Great. So Hopefully before we go, lots of, uh, yeah. So before we go, do you have any? Well, mention, you mentioned one, you know, any book you can, you, you yeah. love that you want to share with the audience. We always put together for those who are listening to this or watching this, why not? And are not aware of this. We put a list of books mentioned here in the show every year. So um, it started as a selfish questions because, because I wanted to know what to read next and I didn't know. Yeah. So I started getting ideas from the awesome people I interview here, such as yourself. So do you happen to have any, you mentioned zero to one, it's by yeah. the founder of PayPal. Uh, probably that's the one, or you have another one? I have I have another one. So basically, there's such good books out there. I, I, I like a lot of the people here, I'm sure they read a lot of autobiographies, a lot of history books, a lot of business books. But one of the books that really last year almost transformed my life, it's called Breathe from the author James Nestor. And he basically tells us that we have lost our innate learning on how to breathe and and the first question you need to ask yourself when do you when you sleep at night do you breathe by your mouth 
or your nose. And most people breathe by or their mouth, sadly. And this has tremendous impact on your health, on your mental capacity, uh, on, your, on the way that you interact with people during the day. So I would really recommend Breathe, the book from James Nesser, um, and I promise you it will change your life. It's a tremendous book. That's a new one. I didn't have one, that one and zero to one as well. So I love that we have two new books to add to the list. So where can people go to learn more about you and Dermadry? So dermadry.com, that is really the best place to go. If not, we have Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, of course, and YouTube, all under the username Dermadry. Um, and if you have this condition, hyperhidrosis, it's very important that number one, you realize that there are solutions out there. Maybe Dermadry is not the correct one for you, but you do not have to have your life ruined by excessive sweating. There are so many solutions. Find the one that's right for you and start living the way that you want to live. So for, for anyone listening to this or watching, uh, everything that uh, he mentioned, you know, everything we discussed, including the topics and the social handles, and of course the website, they're going to be at the ddcinsider.com. When you find the episodes, we will have all the show notes with that information there. Uh, Matthew, it was amazing to have you here. You delivered so much value. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias.